Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of World Politics, I'd like to welcome you to our sixth annual Constitution Day lecture. If you've not been to the Institute of World Politics before, or you're not very familiar with us, we are a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We pride ourselves on being the only graduate school that teaches all of the instruments of statecraft and their strategic and ethical integration into a cohesive whole. At IWP, we're interested not only in the material defense of the United States and our Constitution, but also of its philosophical defense. We believe that a deep understanding of the U.S. Constitution and our constitutional values is essential for a career in national security as well as for scholarship in American foreign policy. I'm very pleased to introduce our adjunct professor, Dr. Douglas Strusen, who will be giving our Constitution Day lecture this, this year. Dr. Strusen <coughs> teaches Islam and contemporary global politics and the geopolitics of the Iranian plateau in South Asia. He's also a professor of international relations at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College in Quantico, Virginia. Previously, he was with the University of Maryland and the U.S. Global Strategy Council. His PhD is in Islamic history, I believe, from the University of Chicago. Uh, he's a prolific author. He's written a book, Islamic Gunpowder em Empires, Ottomans, Safavids, and Mughals. He's also written The Formation of the Mughal Empire. He's also written numerous books on geopolitics, as well as uh, scholarly articles on geopolitics, uh, the, an article such as Managing the Iranian Threat to See uh, Commerce Diplomatically and Geopolitics versus Globalization. Dr. Strusen, thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. And uh, it's a great honor to be here. It's an honor to speak out and be affiliated with the Institute of World Politics, uh, and I'm always real, also always grateful to its founder and moving spirit, John Lanschowski, but it's worth remembering that the Institute could not exist without the efforts of its board of trustees, and the chairman, Owen Smith, we have one of the trustees with us, uh, Rear Admiral Dave Rogers. Uh, it's uh, uh, an honor to talk about the Constitution, especially for someone who is not uh, is not a primarily an expert on that field. And that since I also have the honor of teaching at the Marine Park Command and Staff College, I have to give the honorable disclaimer that uh, nothing I say represents the opinion of Marine Corps University or any agency of the U.S. government. My thesis today is simple, that the uh, Constitution specifically, and the American founding in general, offer profound lessons about international politics and politics in general that we ignore at our peril and have often ignored to our cost. Uh, and that specifically they offer guidance about we need to have ex extremely realistic expectations. The lecture has three parts. One is a, a sort of a personal introduction of the path that brought me here, because like uh, many of you, I am a product of the Constitution. I would not be here without it. Uh, the second is to talk about the, uh, the Constitution and the founding itself, and the third is the lessons that I believe apply to American foreign policy. Uh, my paternal ancestors came from the town of Rogatin, or Rogatin, outside what is now Lvov in the western, in western Ukraine, it was then Lemberg in Austrian Galicia. Uh, my great grandfather was quite successful for a Jew in that time and place, owner of property, considerable businessman, but he made a mistake. He lent a large sum of money to an official who had the power to have him arrested. Uh, he was warned in time to get himself and his family out, but not to liquidate any of his property. So that when he came to Ellis Island, he was as poor as any other immigrant but he was looking not for economic opportunity, but for the rule of law. And so he was looking not at America where the streets were paved with gold, but America, the land of the Constitution, when he came here. 
For that reason, when he settled on the Lower East Side, uh, like other immigrants did at the time, he was not drawn to the Democratic Party. He did not go along with <coughs> Tammany Hall in order to get along with Tammany Hall because Tammany Hall reminded him far too much of what he had left behind in Austrian Galicia and did not represent the rule of law that he had come to the United States to find. So he had the rather unique experience, I suppose, if not quite unique, of being a Republican on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the first century of, uh, our first decade of the last century. And he transmitted that, uh, those, those political views to my grandfather, who actually served as a Republican precinct captain in Manhattan during the Depression, and to my father. And therefore, when my father came to Yale, Yale in the 30s, uh, Yale was swarming at that time with conservative Republicans, uh, a situation which we would find quaint today. Uh, but very few of them were Jews. He was one of perhaps the only one. And uh, one of the Jews at that, whom he met at that time, who was not at that time a conservative, was the political philosopher Harry Jaffa, who uh, became a lifelong friend, and his love, lifelong friend for my father. Harry, uh, so far as I know, is still alive, and if he's alive, he's certainly kicking. Uh, well, he's alive, unless that, something has happened very recently. Uh, no longer young, I believe he's 96. But that, the connection between, uh, through his friendship with Harry Jaffa, my father became acquainted not only with Harry's works, but with Leo Strauss and Leo Strauss's works. And I grew up essentially accepting what people would call the Western Straussian version of political philosophy was the correct one. And as I grew older and read it, I found that I did, in fact, agree with it. And so Harry Jaffa's vision is the primary basis of what I have to say about the Constitution and the founding. Of course, I am not a student of his. I don't qualify as a Western Strauss, and I am not Thomas West or uh, Charles Kessler or any of the others. So please do not judge the Western Straussians by me, although you are certainly free to judge me by the Western Straussians. Uh, and of course, that's not the only contrib contributor to what I have to say, since uh, I have at, at Marine Corps University had the privilege of listening to eight Constitution Day addresses from Justice Ann and Scalia. So, even though, as some of you know, there is a great gulf fixed between Justice Scalia and Professor Jaffa on the significance of uh, original intent, uh, for my purpose today, uh, what they have in common is far more important than their disagreement. So, the, the, the lessons of the founding for foreign policy. Start out. The Constitution is the basis of the American identity. It is what I swore loyalty to, and many of you have at one time or another. It is what we all have in common. Loyalty to the Constitution ultimately takes the place of a, of a nationality in the sense of a, of a nation as a people, as, a, as an ethnicity. As Americans, we have adopted the founders as our ancestors, even though few of us are descended from them. And the, constitution, our, our, the constitutional basis of American identity is more or less unique in the world. Although the Constitution itself did not create the United States, so as the wording of the preamble indicates, 
it, and it establishes the Constitution for the United States, not the United States itself. But as I'll explain in a moment, uh, Dr. Professor Jaffa regards the Declaration of Independence as a constitutive document and that it, in fact, establishes the United States. So we have to be very careful in looking at other states because their basis of identity is different. Um, and uh, it, the, the, the French Fifth Republic did, did not create France. France created the Fifth Republic. Um, the uh, Constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany did not create Germany. Germany existed even when it was just a geographic expression. So this is a very important aspect of the uniqueness of the United States, which we cannot forget when we look abroad. Second point is that the founders regarded the United States as an experiment. They did not know whether they would, could succeed in establishing a durable state of the kind that they sought to establish. They, although I do not know of any of the founders who actually used this approach, I would argue that the founders had, for all practical purposes anyway, looked at Aristotle's six possible varieties of government and the history that, that they knew and judged that a virtuous monarchy would always become a vicious tyranny, that a virtuous aristocracy would always become a vicious oligarchy. So the only hope for a just regime was to establish a regime which would prevent a polity, the virtuous form of the rule of the many, from degenerating into what Aristotle called a democracy, mob rule. The only hope was to do what Madison, writing as Publius, argued was to uh, create a Republican remedy for the diseases most incident to Republican government. But they did not know that it would work. And we should never regard 1789 as a time of completion. The Constitution has faced continuous challenges and I would argue that we have kept its virtues by the skin of our teeth more than once. And that there is no guarantee for the future. We are still pursuing the experiment. We are still trying to prove what Lincoln uh, said that we, need, that we needed to prove in the Gettysburg Address. That government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. In uh, thinking about, uh, about that, I'm reminded of a story from a particular variety of Jewish lore called a Midrash, which is an attempt to clear up a, uh, something inexplicable in the Torah text by a creative approach rather than by an analytical approach. And there's a midrash that the line in Genesis, uh, that on the day, the day of creation, God saw that it was good, indicates that there were pre that God had created other worlds previously, which He had not judged as good and had destroyed them. And when I read about this as a young man for the first time, my immediate thought was, well, how long did God let these previous worlds go before He foreclosed? I mean, have we, have, have we, have in fact, reached that point yet? So, you know, we are, if, 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 if so, now my, my, theo my theology there may be questionable, but I think that the founders would accept the idea that the, their vision for just government is under 
continuous question and reevaluation. In connection with that midrash, there's a far side cartoon showing a god figure putting the, globe, the world back into the oven with the comment, this is obviously still half-baked. <laughs> but uh, we have, example, one challenge stated by the Swiss uh, political theorist, uh, Frederick Bastiat, who argued that representative governments could survive only until the voters realized that they could use their votes to enrich themselves and that that would be a natural expiration point. Uh, James Madison, in one of his later writings, observed a different challenge. He writes, Of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded, because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is the parent of armies from these proceed, proceed debts and taxes, and armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. In war, too, the discretionary power of the executive is extended. Its influence in dealing out offices, honors, and emoluments is multiplied, and all the means of seducing the minds are added to those of subduing the force of the people. The same malignant aspect of republicanism may be traced in the inequality of fortunes and the opportunities of fraud growing out of the state of war and in the degeneracy of manners and of morals engendered by both. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. I submit that the United States, as a great power, facing the assorted evils and challenges that we face in the world today, must engage in what will amount to continuous warfare to survive. So we face the great challenge of maintaining freedom in a state of political war of continual warfare, even though one of the most influential of the founders said that it was impossible. So the experiment goes on. Second point is that the founding assumes the imperfectibility of man. that the, the Declaration speaks not of a right to happiness, but only of the right to pursue it. There is no utopian component in the founding. There was a utopian component, perhaps, in the thought of Thomas Paine, but he was not part of the founding, part of the, the movement, the revolution, but not of the founding. There is no uh, belief that human imperfections can be overcome. The hope is that the very instincts that endanger freedom can be channeled to maintain it through the separation and division of powers. Madison asserts that, that if uh, men were angels, there would be no need for government. In asserting that, he takes for granted that men will not become angels. So the we have, to, we have to recognize that the founding rests on the assumption that humans are imperfect, will remain imperfect, and that the challenge is to create institutions which will channel those, their, their negative instincts in, in, in such a way as to preserve freedom, even when the leadership is mediocre. The third point is that the text of the Constitution does not stand alone. Uh, one of the essential arguments in Professor Jaff is how to think about the American Revolution and in this article, Equality as a Conservative Principle, is that the Constitution and the Declaration together are the constitutive documents of the American polity. That the Declaration is a statement of ends and principle, which does not compromise, but the Constitution, as a working document, reflects prudential compromise. Among those Americans who take the founding seriously, and 
at this point, I'm sorry to say that virtually all of those are conservatives of one variety or another. This position is unusual. Though those who define themselves on the libertarian side of the conservative spectrum, I definitely cleave to the Declaration citing it as a statement of the rights of humans, but fear the Constitution with, its extent, with the extension of government power that it envisions. And others uh, on the cultural conservative side fear the principles of the Declaration, particularly equality, which Professor Jaff has devoted much of his career to explaining and, def and defending. Uh, so the argument is that one should not oppose the two documents, but assume, but, but align the two documents. The, the Declaration as a statement of ends, the Constitution as ways and means. Beyond that, the Federalist Papers are an essential, not only as a means of interpreting the Constitution, but as a source of general political wisdom. One of the things that I'm proud of is that I got a selection of the Federalist Papers into our curriculum at Quantico, so that now when Justice Scalia addresses the audience, he no longer asks, has anyone read any of the Federalist Papers, whether, has any, whether anyone has read all of them. Um, but there are also other documents, such as Washington's Farewell Address, that represent part of the founding and deserve serious attention. The fourth point is that we need to pay attention to the Constitution itself. And this comes really straight from Justice Scalia. To most Americans, if you talk about the Constitution, they will talk primarily about the guarantees of rights in the Bill of Rights. The Constitution means constitutional rights. It is supernally easy to write a document that inventories rights. It is extremely difficult to establish a government to maintain those rights. There is nothing wrong with the statements of, statement of rights in the old Soviet Constitution. They just did, it just didn't mean anything. Without the Constitution, the, the functioning Constitution, the Bill of Rights would be absolutely meaningless. I am reminded of the professor of anatomy who taught in my uh, freshman biology class, which I took only because I had to, um, who reminded people that it was necessary to study anatomy as well as physiology because it's, tr well, it's true that Structure without function is a corpse. Function without structure is a ghost. And uh, without the structure of government to support it, the, the Bill of Rights would mean absolutely nothing. In understanding that structure, we need to, be, you need to consider the point made by Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Nine that a Confederate Republic was not merely the logical way to maintain the unity of the states, but preferable in general and in theory to a unitary republic. By logical extension, he was saying that if the states had not existed, it would have been necessary to invent them in order to have the best opportunity for just government. that the federal structure provides greater protection against the spread of uh, the possibility of tyranny. We usually speak of tyranny of the majority. That expression is not actually from the Federalists, so far as I understand. It's from the Tocqueville. Madison and Federalist 10 speaks only of the danger of majority faction. Beyond the separation of powers among multiple jurisdictions, multiple levels of jurisdiction, there is also the division of powers among the branches. It's worth noting that 
the United States Constitution is one of the very few in the world that established a genuinely bicameral legislature in which the two houses have essentially equivalent, although not identical, powers. The United Kingdom, Canada, France, Germany, all do not have effective bicameral legislatures. They all, but the UK at this point, have upper houses, but none of the upper houses have an equivalent weight to the lower house. We also have, we also do not have a parliamentary system. So the members of the federal legislature do not select the head of government. In a parliamentary system, it is impossible to have a divided government. You can't have one party controlling all or part of the legislature and another controlling chief executive. So the division of powers between the executive and the legislative is far more significant in the uh, United States Constitution than almost everywhere else in the world. Australia does have a genuine bicameral legislature. Um, and in a parliamentary system, the idea of an executive veto is impossible. And it's worth noting that the founders and many of and in the early years of the Republic, the, uh, the veto was seen primarily as a break on the ambitions of the legislature. That's how James K. Pope, in his inaugural address, described the presidential veto. Um, so, without the constitutional structure that we have, the state, the articulation of rights would mean nothing. As Professor Jaff emphasizes, one of the most important aspects of the Constitution is the assumption of legal equality. That each citizen as an individual has the same legal status as any other. Of course, it didn't start out that way. That was part of the prudential compromise. And I think that those who speak of a racist constitution are mistaking a compromise, a weakness for its essence. The conservatives who fear the idea of equality do so because to them it implies a commitment to equality of material condition, not equality of legal status. But for Jaffa, and I submit for the founders and for others, legal equality means only equality of opportunity, not Equality, not equality of status, it is supposed to be an opportunity for natural equality to show itself. And not only for Professor Jaffa. I draw your attention to the great American novel, The Virginian by Owen Wister. Some of you at least are old enough to remember the TV show inspired by the novel. But short of Mark Twain, Owen Wister is about as American a fiction as you can find. And Wister writes, There can be no doubt of this. All America is divided into two classes, the quality and the equality. The latter always will recognize the former when mistaken for it. Both will be with us until our women bear nothing but kings. It was through the Declaration of Independence that we Americans acknowledge the eternal equality of man, or inequality of man. This is a, a bad uh, e-book. In eternal inequality of man. For by it we abolished a cut and dried aristocracy. We had, we had seen little, little mere artificially held up in high places, and great men artificially held down in low places, and our own justice-loving hearts abhorred this violence to human nature. 
Therefore, we decree that every man should henceforth have equal liberty to find his own level. By this very decree, we acknowledge and gave freedom to true aristocracy, saying, let the best man win, whoever he is. Let the best man win. That is America's word. That is true democracy. And true democracy and aristocracy are one and the same thing. If anybody can see this, if that cannot see this, so much the worse for his eyesight. That's Owen Wister, who also came up with the memorable line, we'll pat him off at the pass, and uh, when you call me that smile. Um, de Tocqueville also regards equality, individuality, as the central characteristic of the American polity. And it is the basis of the Tocqueville's warning that I cited in the, in the announcement for this talk, which I'll get back to later. We should also make note of Washington's farewell address, not merely his warning of, of, to avoid permanent alliances, which most leaders have taken as a statement of moral principle rather than practical advice, but Washington argues that the, the Republic could not survive permanent partisan division based on geographic region. He believed that such a division would ultimately be fatal to the Republic, and of course it very nearly was. It's also worth noting that although we speak of the founding as if it were saying the the founders did not all agree. And even though uh, Madison and Hamilton wrote, tried to write as one in the Federalist, as Publius, not as one or the other, there were certainly differences of emphasis. And one of these is reflected in Hamilton's Federalist Six. In Federalist VI, Hamilton is arguing that the unity of the states is necessary because if they remained, if they, if they became separated, that there would inevitably be conflict between them. And in the course of making that argument, he looks to history as it's, it's familiar, and he points out that Confederate republics, or commercial republics rather, have not been peaceful. He writes, Sparta, Athens, Rome, and Carthage were all republics. Two of them, Athens and Carthage, of the commercial kind. Yet they were as often engaged in wars, offensive and defensive, as the neighboring monarchies at the same times. Sparta was little better than a well-regulated camp, and Rome was never sated of carnage and conquest. Carthage, though a commercial republic, was the aggressor in the very war that ended in her destruction. Hannibal had carried her arms into the heart of Italy and to the gates of Rome before Scipio gave him an overthrow in the territories of Carthage and made a conquest of the Commonwealth. A little later he goes on, the provinces of Holland, till they were overwhelmed in debts and taxes, took a leading and conspicuous part in the wars of Europe. They had furious contests with England for the dominion of the sea and were among the most persevering and most implacable of the opponents of Louis XIV. In the government of Britain, the representatives of the people compose one branch of the national legislature. Commerce has been for ages the predominant pursuit of that country. Few nations, nevertheless, have been more frequently engaged in war in the wars in which that kingdom have been engaged. The new, in numerous instances proceeded, proceeded from the people. Much of American foreign policy rests on the assumption that the spread of representative government will bring about peace. An argument, for, an argument first articulated in uh, Immanuel Kant's work on perpetual peace. Hamilton is one of the few voices to challenge that assumption. And I think, it's, uh, I think that we need to take his challenge extremely seriously. There is, many people assume that 
there has been peace, an absence of conflict among great powers, since 1935 because of the spread of democracy, as well as the stance of the U.S. in the Cold War, of course. Um, but I would argue that peace since 1945 has been kept by the same forces which have always led to peace or war in the past. That peace is not an opposed principle to war, but that peace is kept by the same instruments with which war is made. In Walter Russell Mead's well-known typology of American foreign policy, he identifies one school as Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonians differ from the other schools that he identifies. The Wilsonian idealists who believe in a, in a global mission to spread American ideals that, in what uh, Mead refers to as a crusader state. The Jeffersonians believe that the United States, in order to preserve its freedom, must shun international involvement and, sur and, and spread its ideas only by example. The Jacksonians see the United States as needing little of the world and owing nothing to it with our any international mission based on a narrow definition of national interest. The Hamiltonians alone, in Mead's view, see the United States as a state subject to the same laws and forces of power politics as any other. They do not deny American exceptionalism, but they deny that American exceptionalism exempts the United States from, power, from, from the realities of power politics. I like to consider myself a Hamiltonian. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt has been described as a Neo-Hamiltonian, so that I guess would make me a Neo-Neo-Hamiltonian. Um, and I contend that the United States survived to its healthy maturity, not primarily on the basis of its geographic isolation of the ocean barriers, but because of the Pax Britannica, that the United States essentially subcontracted management of the balance of power to the United Kingdom and benefited from the United Kingdom's success in doing so until 1914. I submit that even before, or even while, uh, the War of 1812 was going on, I guess yesterday or just very briefly, or recently was the anniversary of the attack on Fort McHenry. Uh, even while American frigates were sinking British frigates, the United States benefited from the role of British ships in the line, of the line, not to mention the army of the Duke of Wellington and of course British gold, in preventing the French from establishing hegemony over the continent of Europe. And of course, within a very few years of the end of that war, we signed the rush Bagot Treaty, which uh, demilitarized the frontier between the United States and Canada. So we were always the beneficiaries of the balance of power. We simply were exempt from the cost of maintaining it until 1916 when the British recognized, of course they didn't publicize, that they were out of money and could carry on the war only on the basis of American credit. So we were in the war financially before we were militarily, and our financial role was probably more essential than our military role. De Tocqueville wrote, the Constitution of the United States resembles those fine creations of human industry which ensure wealth and renown to their inventors but which are profitless in other hands. He did so because at the time that he wrote, he did not 
see a, another society in which the social conditions that permitted what he can call American democracy to prevail. We, in going forth in the world, need to bear that wisdom in mind. So let's go on to talk about the lessons and begin with the imperfectibility of man. The imperfectibility of man implies the imperfectibility of the international system. That the belief that was a basis of policy for both Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt, that it was possible for the United States, with its example, with, by example and by its power, to substitute a not world government, but world government governance by agreement for power politics. I submit that all, in spite of its deep roots in the American founding, that that position ultimately contradicts the basic principles of the American founding. That, that, is, that goes back to the difference between Meade's Hamiltonian school and Meade's Wilsonian school. That uh, the Hamiltonians believe that the role of the United States as a great power is to maintain order by maintaining the balance of power and preventing hegemony, rather than to transform, trying to seek to transform the world into one in which power does not matter. We should also recognize that given the experimental nature of the American polity and its extraordinary uh, uniqueness in that the, constitu the, the, constitu the, the Constitution does in fact constitute not merely the nation, not merely the state, but the, but the nation. And the term nation-state actually refers to two things people and government. There is so an American nation only insofar as, in, as the citizens of the country identify with the Constitution. Uh, the problem of equality and identity is extremely difficult for Republican polities around the world. Consider, for example, the enormous difficulty of the Republic of Turkey, which had its basis in ethnic Turkish nationalism, in dealing with its Kurdish minority, which perhaps now they may have solved, but it was it, 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 it tortured the, the polity for decades, and of course resulted in extremely bloody civil conflict in. Iraq and Afghanistan, most of the citizens identify themselves less by their loyalty to a national government than by an ethnic or ethno-religious identity. That form of, of political identity contradicts the assumptions behind the existence of the American polity and make the ability to transfer American <coughs> institutions to American style institutions to those states or states like that an extremely dubious proposition. Federalism is an essential element of the American Constitution and Yet, in Afghanistan in particular, we have supported the formation of an essentially unitary regime in one of the most divided countries in the world. The division has not only to do with ethnicity, but physical geography. In the vast majority of countries in the world, it has been possible to reach all of their citizens 
with shortwave, if not FM or television broadcasting and to help to create a common identity on that basis. In Afghanistan, the physical geography makes that kind of radio transmission impossible. There is many people live in mountain valleys which could receive transmissions from outside of that valley virtually only by satellite. And yet I have heard an Afghan minister of state, who I'm no longer in office, say that it was inconceivable in Afghanistan that any entity outside of Kabul would have the power to levy a tax. We have forgotten in many cases that the essential structure of the U.S. government existed before the Constitution. That it was not necessary to establish the idea, to create the idea of an independent judiciary. That the federal structures existed. That national elections, the establishment of the national regime was the end of the process. We have often been tempted to see the creation of a constitution as the beginning of the process. And I am reminded of uh, discussions that I used to have with my father in which he complained of people who called for justice rather than law and order as if justice were possible without order. Order is certainly possible without justice, but not the other way around. And the establishment of effective governmental institutions and independent judiciary um, may need to precede rather than uh, follow the establishment of elected government. But most of all, we have to recognize that our founding is unique. It's, but it's still an experiment, and we have enough trouble holding on to it ourselves. Uh, I do not mean by that to say that we should eschew a global role and stay home and take care of ourselves. I wish we could afford to. But if you looked at the size of the Royal Navy lately, you realize that we can no longer, we cannot go back to subcontract acting that mission. But we should go forth in the world with a limited, with a, with a limited view of what we can accomplish. And with the recognition that moral force cannot replace the need for real power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sturzen. Uh, we've got time for questions. Uh, because our event is being recorded, we do request that you state your name and affiliation prior to your question. And I, 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 would, I would ask that you also stand and speak loudly, loudly so the audience can hear you. Uh, sir. Uh, yes, I have a question. I'm, uh, I'm Russell King, uh, federal employee. I have a question about Article 1, Section 8, Declaration of War, as opposed to Article 5 of the NATO Charter. I believe the last time in U.S. history that we had an Article 1, Section 8, Declaration of War was World War II against Germany and Japan. And I believe the only time in NATO history that Article 5 was invoked, the NATO Charter, was in Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, it was a response to an asymmetric attack on the United States that involved destruction of civilian airliners. Now right now the Dutch government is investigating the Malaysian airline downing, and again it's a, it's a similar sort of situation, except this time uh, it's not the United States citizens being killed, it's the citizens of other NATO countries being killed. So I think that the Dutch would be considering that. Now many people seem to be disparaging Russian power, but now that Barack Obama's talking about the possibility of bombing Syria, um, Assad is basically sort of a client state of Russia, and Russia has, for one thing, uh, 
in, in, in a naval interest in Syria. I believe uh, Russia used the warm water ports of Syria, and when they took over uh, Sevastopol, they freed themselves from the lease that Ukraine had on them so they could have more naval activity there. And when they come through the Turkish Straits, the Montreux Convention gives them privilege, gives the Russians a privilege in terms of transit because they're a Black Sea nation, more privileged than ours. And um, so my question is, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that Putin, when he hears all this uh, commotion about the possibility of bombing Syria, well, he has a very big interest there. I'm tending to think he'll, he'll probably get a hold of Obama and probably maybe give him some sort of offer he can't refuse because he wants to control exactly how the bombing would be in Syria. And um, I, I'd also like to know about the, the friction that might, might occur between Article 1, Section 8 and um, the Article 5 of the Nation <coughs> Charter based upon sovereign decisions of the nation to go to war. Well, first of all, I would remind you that I am not, in fact, a constitutional scholar, and uh, so I can the, the, the authority of my answer is limited. But I do know that treaties approved by the Senate have the force of law in the United States. So that uh, essentially Article 5 of the NATO treaty is American law and the United States is bound by law to meet its treaty obligations. That, of course, is not a guarantee that we will do so. We certainly didn't with regard to Vietnam in 1970. In 1975. Uh, with regard to the broader framework that you're speaking about, I would like to make one simple point, and that is that given the state of great power relationships today, I think it is uh, easily possible to construct an argument, and I believe that the only reason that there is not a world war going on today is the existence of nuclear weapons. That without the fear of nuclear, of nuclear escalation, that there almost certainly would be combat going on between great powers. And the United States approach to the Ukraine, again, speaking only as an individual at this point, I would describe as ageopolitical, ageopolitical. Uh, that I believe Zbigniew Brzezinski once, once observed that, that, that Russia without the Ukraine is not a great power. With the Ukraine it is. That argument, I think, should have been the basis of American policy towards the Ukraine. And that the we have instead uh, treated the situation as a matter of breaking international rules rather than a fundamental threat to the balance of power under national order. Uh, the scenario that you sketch out is possible, and the suggestion that you make that uh, the American administration might tailor its actions against the so-called Islamic State uh, to avoid uh, Russian objections is plausible, though certainly not inevitable. I would also point out that the founders, Hamilton at least, I believe envisioned the possibility of a situation in which it would be necessary for the executive leadership of the country to take military action without explicit legislative justification. I, unfortunately, uh, I do not have the page marked in this copy, I don't think. Um, but Hamilton, here, oh, here it is in, in number 23. The authorities essential to the common defense are these, to raise armies, to build and equip fleets, to prescribe rules for the government of both, to direct their operations, to provide for their support. These powers ought to exist without limitation because it is impossible to foresee or to define the extent and variety of national exigencies and the correspondent extent and variety of means which may be necessary to satisfy them. 
The circumstances that endanger the safety of nations are infinite, and for this reason no constitutional shackles can wisely be imposed on the power to which the care of it is committed. This power ought to be coextensive with all the possible combinations of such circumstances. The problem, is, as Madison, of course, put it, is to reconcile that kind of power with liberty. Uh, next. Apple. I'm Dave Rogers. I'm a trustee here and a lecturer at the Joint Forces Staff College down in Norfolk. When the students can't sleep, they call me to come down and talk, and I put them right to sleep. <laughs> or is when he speaks at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, they wake up. <laughs> Doctor, thank you very much for the presentation. My question would be, uh, you highlighted that the Constitution was a working document. And do you think that there are checks and balances in place that would keep this working document from taking a bad turn and uh, taking us to places where we're, we're going to get, but we're going to make a mess of what we have right now? As I said, I believe that we have kept the republic we have by the skin of our teeth, and that threats internal and external will always exist, in great part because of the continuous temptation to, for, for people to look for a way to transcend the fundamental imperfections of the human condition. Uh, the uh, temptation of totalitarianism, which Karl Popper discusses in the beginning of the open society and its enemies, which uh, uh, contemporary conservatives unfortunately tend to ignore because of his um, interpretation of Plato as a proto-totalitarian. But Popper essentially argues that this, the more sensitive people are, the more they care about other people, the more they empathize with the pain of others, the more likely they are to demand a system which will promise the removal of that pain. To, to, to uh, accept an ideology that promises utopia. Uh, I remember my 13-year-old daughter, who was then 13 years, now 30, and uh, in her second year of graduate school in English at the University of Texas studying Shakespeare. Uh, only when she, when she was 13, she talked about how much it hurt her when she realized that the people she heard about suffering on the news were as real as she was. That's an example of the phenomenon that uh, Popper was talking about. And that's, he was attempting to explain why intellectuals in particular seemed susceptible to the totalitarian temptation. And his answer was essentially because they knew and they cared about the suffering of others. Uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, so that temptation always exists. One of the books my father got from uh, the Conservative Book Club, I think in the early 70s, was entitled Utopia, the Perennial Heresy. So the danger always exists. Uh, and our survival this, thus far should not make us complacent. And of course, one of the, the dangers is the tendency to look at citizens not as individuals of equal status, but to focus instead on the uh, position of groups, rights of groups. Sir. Uh, Carl Golovin, a student here at IWP, uh, part time also a retired U.S. Customs agent. Uh, Andrew Jackson, in his farewell address of 1837, after he'd ended the Second Bank of the U.S., the Federal Reserve of his day, uh, wrote passionately about how the Constitution was intended to provide a circulating money of gold and silver coin 
to protect the wealth of the laboring class from being inflated away by the expansion of credit to benefit the largest corporations, politicians, and financial interests. And uh, the stability to relationships brought by gold was recognized at the end of World War II when the Bretton Woods Agreement called for a redeemability in gold of US dollars accumulated by foreign governments. But we've broken with that agreement, and we've substituted the petrodollar. You know, we enforce that the dollar is redeemable in OPEC oil with tremendous consequences to peace. And my question is, isn't it time to restore a Bretton Woods type of agreement and bring gold back as an honest unit of account that brings stability and peace between nations? I do not pretend to have the detailed knowledge of international economics to be able to provide you with an answer to that question. Um, I suspect that an attempt to restore a gold standard would have a tremendous effect upon liquidity uh, and the, the, the possibility of it would, would have the inevitable result, I think, of reducing the volume of international trade, which, uh, and we experienced that once before, at least, after the passage of the smooth hawley tariff, which was intended to improve the balance of payments at the early part of the Depression, and did so at the cost of uh, reducing our exports by 75%. So while I understand the temptation behind the restoration of the gold standard, I have serious doubts about its practicality. I do, however, have to admit that the fact that the United States today still has by far the largest gold reserve in the world is something that makes me a little more comfortable. Uh, but I, I don't have a better answer for you <coughs> than that, I'm afraid, sir. Uh, my name is John Mikowski. I'm a retired federal employee. Uh, I, Kissinger has come out with some, a new tome, a new book. It's called uh, The World Order, Changing World Order. I wonder if you had any opinions if you've read it or if you've seen it. or. Uh, I, I have to admit that all, all I have seen is uh, um, Former Secretary of State Clinton's review of it in the Post. Uh, other, other articles similarly reflecting on the future mega trends with regard, for example, to the internet and so forth, are also questioning whether or not the world order is able to survive as the nation states balkanizing or if it's going to be flat, more power will be flatter. Any well, opinion on that? Um, I would say. Take one observation, first of all. Predicting the future is extremely hard to do. Predicting the future badly is extremely easy. One of the, one of the easiest ways to predict the future badly is to assume that it will be like the present, only more so. That uh, uh, the, what seemed to us to be the most important current trends are those uh, that will uh, are those that appear that those that will, that will in fact shape the future. Uh, with regard to the future order world being based on 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 states, make and I refer to an observation made by a distinguished former member of our faculty, kind of kind of the graphing rate at a conference back in 2002, uh, where at, at the venue of the conference uh, was near a building then owned by Lucent, and Lucent actually had a flag. And Mr. de Graffenry pointed out that in spite of Lucent's having a flag as a corporation, no one was going to look to Lucent for the services that they expected from government, beginning with security. So, I think that the state has is still kicking, but the shape of the world is extremely difficult. I would also say that, in spite of Secretary Clinton's argument that there's a surprising amount of idealism in Kissinger, 
that Kissinger is still ultimately a realist to whom power matters but ideas do not. And I submit that the failure to recognize the importance of ideas is the uh, reason that the, that the realist school of international relations is fundamentally unrealistic. Uh, in the back. David Gordon, just a little bit of research. I had a question, and I hope I formulate this correctly. Um, it kind of bubbled up in my mind by your speech. When uh, now President Obama, Obama was debating uh, Romney on uh, his third, uh, third uh, debate over foreign policy, one of the questions was asked is what's the most important uh, role for the president? And uh, the president at that time responded that. And if I'm incorrect, I believe this is pretty accurate. He said protecting uh, the civilians by Romney's response was um, in relation to the Constitution. Framing that scenario, how would you think with the knowledge that you've gained over your lifetime, especially coming from the Federalist Papers, that our founding fathers would look at that those two different responses? Well, I would think that the founders would say that the authority of the president, president derives from the Constitution, and that what he's talking about is not the, is not uh, the mission of the president, but the mission of the executive branch. And I believe that the founders, certainly Hamilton, would have accepted Adam Smith's definition of the three responsibilities of government, which are essentially the protection against external aggression, maintenance of order and the rule of law, and the maintenance of public works which are essential to the general welfare but impossible for private entities to operate profitably. Uh, so I would think that their their argument would be uh, that um, the pres it is an essential role of the president to, as the leader of the executive branch, to provide security for the citizens, but that that responsibility is. Uh, um, um, inherent in the constitutional role of commander-in-chief, so that there's really no contradiction between the two answers. It's a difference of emphasis or framework. Andy. I'm Andy Clementina, citizen. Um, Dr. Struzan, you have said a little bit about perhaps what you would have done uh, with regards to Russia and Ukraine. Can you say more about if you were in charge of our foreign policy, what would be the governing principles uh, motivating that foreign policy as relates to some of the hot spots that we find ourselves in today? Uh, thank you for asking such a small, neat question. <laughs> uh, I would say that One undivine principle is that as a great power, as a superpower, the United States has a disproportionate share of responsibilities for global order and must therefore pay a disproportionate share of the world's protection costs. And that one of the first priorities has to be to maintain an economy prosperous enough for the United States to play that role. So that's, you know, that, that I think you know, we have to remember. I would draw the attention of those of you who are students anyway to the essay by Edward Mead Earle, in, which appears in both editions of the classic Makers of Modern Strategy. On, Alexander, on Adam Smith and Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List 
as the, uh, the theorists of the economic basis of national power. I uh, should point out that before this edition, before the Rossiter edition of, of the Federalist Papers, now uh, with additional material by Charles Kessler, was out the, the, so far as I know, the standard edition of the Federalist Papers was actually edited by Edward Mead Earl. Um, so that's the first. Second, the, the United States needs to recognize that we face a series of adversaries who, although they have perhaps little in common, fundamentally challenge the principles of global order and law that we recognize. That not only do the totalitarian Islamists of both the Sunni and Shi varieties do so, but so does China and so does Russia. And that we have the responsibility to ensure that the balance of power does not permit the, the state adversaries to put their principles in effect. One essential point that I left out of my prepared remarks is that all of those entities have a fundamental agreement, disagreement, or with the nature of the American polity, or with a Western idea, rather, of human rights, which is ultimately comes out of American originals, but is expressed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All of them share the position that the, that the Western conception of human rights overemphasizes the rights of the individual to the expense of the greater good. Uh, that difference is fundamental. And although we no longer face the kind of totalitarian ideology that we faced in the form of Marxism-Leninism, we face series of a set of different ideologies, all of which challenge ours in a fundamental way. So that we you know we are not in a a post-Cold War world. We are in a world of a series of overlapping Cold Wars. And that it is not a matter of choice for us that, they, that these wars have come to us. We have not gone to them. And that we, we need to recognize our, the nature of the challenge and the limits, the limits to the way in which we can counter it. We can prevent China from establishing hegemony in the South China Sea. We cannot change, make China into something other than China. Um, but I, I think that, that we ultimately, we would, I would say that we have to uh, recognize that our position in the world depends on our economic and military power and we need to take you know, steps to maintain that. I would also uh, say again that uh, it's only the possibility of a of nuclear escalation that has prevented the conflicts between China and its neighbors, between Russia and its neighbors, from becoming open warfare. And that the state of the American nuclear arsenal which is virtually forgotten, is an absolutely critical matter. Uh, and that, that we need to um, go back to a state of preparedness that an old 
cartoon representative. The intent of the cartoon was entirely different, but to me it represents the way that things ought to be. It has a general saying that our arsenal of a million intercontinental ballistic missiles is backed by a, a complete set of state-of-the-art conventional weapons. And we also have a stockpile of clubs and stones. So whatever history, history offers us, we're ready. <laughs> and that ultimately, we should not look for look we should not look for opportunities to intervene, and we should not intervene in conflicts with the assumption that we can intervene in conflicts without taking sides. But the United States today faces the same kind of responsibilities it did during the Cold War, but without a national consensus about the nature of those responsibilities. Time for, one more. time for one more question. One more. Sir. Well, uh, I'll just uh, follow up. You had some uh, background in Islamic studies, right? That, I, that is my, my, my I, graduate field. Uh, I have a, a father-in-law who's Lebanese, and he looks at this situation over there right now. It's going on, and questions why the United States wants to evolve itself, in the sense that you essentially got the Sunni and the Shia at conflict. And his sense is, let them have at it. Instead of us having to go over and flatten his area, they're going to do it to each other. Do you have any opinion about that? Well, first of all, I'm reminded of what my father told me that he said on a, that he thought on uh, June 22, 1941, when Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. He sincerely hoped that the two totalitarian powers would devour each other. Um, Unfortunately, things are not likely to work out that neatly. Um, we are dealing with totalitarian ideologies here. Totalitarian regimes are by their nature incompatible with peace. As Winston Churchill put it, uh, dictators ride upon tigers from which they dare not dismount. And the, um, we also need to understand that in spite of the, the fundamental difference among Sunnis and Shi'is, in fact, historically, the totalitarian Islamist thinkers have taken that difference less seriously than mainstream Muslims on, have on both sides. That in spite of the impression to the contrary, that um, Sunni and Shi'i totalitarian entities have been willing to cooperate. That uh, while uh, until what was like November 9th, 2001, the Islamic Republic of Iran regarded the Taliban in Afghanistan as deadly enemies. Once the United States had was present in Afghanistan and had participated in their defeat, they became allies against the United States. Um, one of my students at command staff, the late uh, Major James uh, Weiss Weasel, Cobra pilot, was killed in Afghanistan by an uh, Iranian supplied weapon. At least that's uh, as best I'm informed as, as, uh, as the source of the ordinance. Uh, so we, we, we do not have the luxury of uh, simply letting them kill each other. Of course, they would kill a hell of a lot of other people. So first of all, and I would remind you, lastly, that one side would win. That they, it's not that, that one that they would own. And would we care? Would we? Would, would it be preferable for us to um, deal with an unchallenged Sunni or Shi totalitarian power dominating the Middle East? Uh, there are no easy options with regard to, uh, to the situation. I would also, you know, stepping outside of the lecture context with my own expertise, you know, present the argument 
that we are up against totalitarian ideologies in the form of totalitarian Islamism, but, though, but that those totalitarian ideologies are not Islam itself. They represent an amalgam or a fusion of the persistent dissident tradition of political activism in Islam, that is of a tradition which, con which consistently challenged the established order in the Islamic world on the grounds that it was not Islamic enough with Western totalitarian ideologies. And that uh, we need to, therefore, to recognize that we, that, we, that we are not in a clash of civilizations, but in a clash of ideologies. And that if we mistake it for a clash of civilizations, we run the risk of transforming it into one. That's not, that is not in any way minimizing the threat or softening the nature of the enemy, but defining the threat in what I believe is a more precise way than common. Mr. Uh, thank you very much for your insight.